starting this morning with a bit of a confession and an apology to all of you out there. We've been asleep at the wheel this past 10 days because we haven't covered the story that we're going to cover on today's show the way we should have covered it. There was stuff going on. We were in New York, swanking around the place, helping to launch Rooney. The, uh, they won their first game, by the way. Did they? Congratulations to, to all at Rooney. Yeah. Uh, you were hanging out with WWE star... JBL. Yeah. Uh, hanging out, you know, lo looking over Lexington with the big man himself. Maybe, maybe it was all a ploy, maybe it was a distraction tactic so that we wouldn't cover the story. Send us to, to JBL and JBL uh, kind of is, is the smoke and mirrors. And then St. Patrick's Day happened and we won the Grand Slam and there was stuff to talk about, right? Yes. But now we won the Grand sport. Slam, we've, we've taken care of that and um, the fixtures crisis in the GA. we'll come back to that, don't worry, we'll, we'll definitely cover that. We're going to talk a little bit about the Grand Slam a little bit later on. But. Yeah, we are, totally. But we didn't cover uh, Shane Ross's tweets and not the one about Dave Kearney being Rob Kearney or Rob Kearney being Dave Kearney or however he managed to screw that up and, you know, oh, look how funny I am, I accidentally can't well tell the brothers apart, which, you know, when you think about it, might actually just have been a bit of a joke on his part to make everybody think, ah, that lad, he's a good lad, you know? It's, you know, the boring Carney's Twitter account. Maybe he's seen that and it was actually a, oh, I can't tell you guys apart joke, which meant that everybody was talking about that and places him in a very nice, benign context, as opposed to a front runner who shows up and lifts the Triple Crown and the Grand Slam trophy and seeks all the attention for himself. Because this is an attention seeker, remember that. This is the guy who tweeted last week, pleased to have announced 150 grand for resurfacing of all weather pitch at Loretto Beaufort. This will improve playing conditions for students and at Loretto HC members, hashtag sports grant, hashtag let's keep active. That wasn't the one that actually uh, got everybody up in arms. It was the 150 grand for the other hockey pitch that got people pissed off. Um, but there's more to come from that because today in the mirror, which I don't have right hand, I do, yeah, here on the front page of the mirror is outrage at Ross Sport Funding. And it is actually the mirror who've done the best work on this over the last 10 days or so, as the rest of us have been busy talking rugby. And, Basically. And New York and uh, doing what it is that you do when you get distracted by stuff in the midst of this incredibly brilliant news cycle for sport and Roy McElroy. Um, they've quietly been funneling out the details of these grants to make sure that, well, you know, uh, hopefully nobody's going to take too much of a time or care over actually finding out who we're giving the money to, right? Right. Uh, well, the reason why this has kind of popped back up, as you say, is because of these tweets and because the appeals process seems to have reached some sort of conclusion in the sports capital programme. Like last November, uh, these, a lot of these figures were allocated, the initial grants were allocated, and th at that time then, appeals were allowed to be lodged. Now, whether or not everybody knew they were allowed to appeal these grants remains to be seen because I think it's the first time that an appeals process has actually been brought in for the sports capital programme, which isn't an annual thing, we should say. It could become an annual thing now that the boom is back, but this is kind of a, an unusual sort of capital programme. It's a very lucrative one, and if you know how to operate the system well, you will get your tuppence worth for your efforts. A lot of people, though, naturally aren't fully aware of the ins and outs of all of this, as we've seen manifest itself over the last couple of days. Yeah, it's actually really hard to fill in these forms. Um, and there's a bunch of different criteria that you have to meet. Um, some of the criteria, you've got the criteria there. Some of the criteria involve actually um, the benefit to your community. And you're supposed to really be coming from a disadvantaged background. That's like one of the, the criteria as outlined in the terms of reference by the Department of Sport who apparently, independently of all political influence, adjudicate on where the money goes. But we know that's not how Irish life works. We know that a phone call can help get a wind farm, you know, checked on, according to the Taoiseach last week. That's how Irish politics works. So the notion that the Department of Sport and their department and the officials within the department are completely independent of any influence from outside is impossible to believe because they're obviously under difficulty uh, in a difficult situation when the minister phones and goes that's cool there yeah it's in my constituency it's a great school great hockey pitch definitely need it top hockey good hockey what are you going to do you're going to say fuck you minister you're not you're going to try and find the way to go tick 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 yeah okay there we go it's off my desk i'm not saying that's what happened in this case no we're not saying that that's what happened in this case but it's believable that this has happened in cases down through the ages because this appears to have been, from the get-go, treated like a slush fund by politicians all the way back to the beginning of the sports capital funding. And we'll, we'll bring you some examples of stuff in the, in, um, later on in the show. But there's no independent, there's no political party that so far, uh, apart from the ones who were in government during the um, uh, crash, when this 
didn't actually happen. Exactly. And they didn't have the opportunity to do it. But there are no political party that has been, not been somehow sucked into the notion that, yeah, this is a slush fund for me to give uh, stuff to my constituency. The socio-economic factors are just worth pointing out. It's something we're going to get into quite a bit uh, this morning. Paul Barrett, the chairperson of the Neptune Basketball Club down in Cork, is going to join us uh, on the line a little bit later on. He has felt the brunt of this in the opposite direction. He was told that he is in too advantageous an area to be given the funding to repair the roof in the Neptune Stadium, which clearly is quite a big issue. It's a roof. I mean, it's an indoor arena. I mean, there's the leakages have happened in here. And it, they were told that essentially the project is not in a disadvantaged area, despite the fact that Barrett himself has pointed out that there are a number of desh schools in the region, and it's impossible to say that this gets a zero in the in the one to three scale of actual disadvantage. They give those schools free access to the hall for PE. So those schools, which are desh schools within hundreds of meters yes. from the door of the Neptune Basketball Club, three schools: uh, North Mon, St Vincent's, and North Prez, use the facilities for free. Yes. Which is precisely what is supposed to happen with these facilities. So ideally, a couple of years back, a decision was made that you wouldn't give money anymore to a single sport because communities need to be brought together by sport as opposed to just your GA club, just your soccer club, just your rugby club, just whatever. So they asked for clubs to team up with schools. Apparently this is a big issue, according to Thomas Byrne from Fianna Fáil in his press release. Now, uh, those in a glass house shouldn't be throwing stones, Mr Byrne, but we'll come back to that at some point later on. Um, this is the perfect situation where it seems like uh, an organisation needs some help. There's a hole in the roof, it's basketball in Cork, there's loads of schools using the facilities. What's the issue? It's, precisely. It's also the only basketball club in the entire country that owns its own venue, so it doesn't have outside finances coming in. It depends massively on this sort of funding. We also know, uh, in terms of the sport, that it doesn't have a, a body like the GAA funding from the top, and that's not any bit of a criticism at Basketball Ireland. It's literally just the resources that they've got there. They don't have the gate receipts. They've got a fraction of the gate receipts of the likes of the GEA. And there has been other big projects in Gaelic games that have been funded by the Sports Capital Programme, which should be the case, don't get me wrong. But in terms of the amount of money being pumped in to Gaelic games from the Sports Capital Programme, it makes you think twice about whether or not it's the correct sport that should be getting all this money. For example, uh, Trulli IT and their new Gaelic games set up got seven and a half million uh, in the Sports Capital Programme, which is obviously a, a huge chunk and potentially completely deserved. But it is Gaelic games. Who's the... Who's the um Deputy Minister for Sport at the moment? Brendan Griffin. What's his constituency? Kerry. Where's Trilly IT? Kerry. There's no connection here, obviously. No connection whatsoever, of course. We're just pointing, pointing this out. Now, let's move on, because we want to get to the Sports Capital Programme and the absolute nonsense that is the administering of the Sports Capital Programme. People have, uh, over the last week or so, kind of begun to, woke up to, to wake up to the situation with regards to... Uh, the grant that was made to Wesley. And so on Wesley College's website, uh, they say they're very fortunate to have an expansive campus containing outstanding sporting facilities, four rugby pitches, one floodlit rugby grid, I don't know what a rugby grid is, a soccer pitch, two full-size hockey astroturf pitches, two mini hockey pitches, 16 tennis courts during the summer season, 16 tennis courts, two cricket pitches, two outdoor basketball courts, one gymnasium, one sports hall, and an athletics track and field facilities. And so they got 150 grand from uh, Minister Ross. Obviously, it's in his constituency, uh, and they needed the 150 grand to resurface one of their hockey pitches. Joining us this morning is Paul Barrett, who's the chairperson of Neptune Basketball Club in Cork. They applied for regional funding in the 2017 Sports Capital Programme. Paul, good morning to you. Good morning, lads. Obviously, Neptune, one of the most famous and storied basketball uh, clubs in the country, all the way back to when basketball was uh, at its absolute peak. How is the club at the moment? Before we get into the details of this sports grant, just tell us a little bit about the role that the club plays in the local Cork community in terms of membership and what the age profile of your members are. Um, well, I suppose the club is in a very healthy position at the moment in terms of our, our, our playing capabilities. At the moment, I think we're, we're up around... 250 players. That would include somewhere around 70 academy players, which would be six to nine years of age. So, from that perspective, we're in a very healthy um, position. Okay, and you so know? I understand as well. You guys actually own your own facility, which is unusual in basketball in Ireland. 
It is. It's very unusual. Um, our stadium was built in 1985, um, 42 years old at the moment. So, you know, the guys that went before us had the foresight to to get the idea up off the ground, first of all, and, and um, deliver it. So, you know, we funded this and built this and kept it running with little or no assistance, really, for the last 32 years. So, you know, quite an achievement, really. Paul, one of the things about these grants is that um, a lot of clubs are actually at a, an immediate disadvantage because they don't own their own facilities. And as a result, the, the government has taken the view through the sports capital grant that they're not going to give money to organisations that don't own their own facilities because whoever does own it might take the benefits from the updated facilities and take it away, which is why it looks like you guys are actually in a really good position to, to get a grant. Just tell us a little bit about your, your membership, will you? Because I, I know that having DESH schools in the area was one of the um, important factors that you thought might help you. So where do you draw your membership from? Um, generally speaking, it's to the local area, but we do reach out around Cork City. Um, you know, we attract players from around the city, but generally speaking, it's an outside club. It's a Blackpool club, but obviously has been. So, you know... Just the surrounding hinterland of, of, of the club, really. Um, uh, Blackpool, Foundry, Granerborough, that type of an area, you know. And do you have deals with the local schools to use the facilities? We do. Um, you know, we do share the venue. Uh, we do try to help people out when we can. Um, I know the North Press use it as um, a, a P facility twice a week. And the North Man use it for basketball practice as well for their basketball teams. Um, so we do, we, you know, we're, we're part of the community and we understand that. And we're kind of always, we lean towards helping other local teams when we can. So, um, we do our best. There's no doubt about that. So, Paul, scroll back for me then and tell me about um, the decision to go for a grant. When did you realise that you might be eligible for a grant and what was that process like? But I suppose I took over as chairman, um, I think it's three years ago now at this stage, and the roof was an immediate problem from my point of view. As in, I could see that it was going to cause us a lot of trouble coming down the track. So um, we started to keep our eyes and ears open in terms of um, trying to get funding. And there was a sports capital grant program announced a number of years ago, but a few years ago, and we applied at that stage. So um, it's been on our radar for a while um, because it is a very serious issue. You know, uh, the roof is well done by itself by this. And we've had engineering reports done on it and it just requires a new roof. It's as, it's as simple as that. So this isn't the first time you've applied? No, it's not. Um, we have applied specifically for funding for the roof um, on the last round for sure. And what, what were you, why were you rejected then, or did you find out? Um, I suppose when we were rejected on the first occasion, I didn't really dig into it as much as I possibly should have, because um, it was our first time out. You know, and I, I had imagined at that stage that the, the, the queue for funding would have been enormously long, and people might have been ahead of us in that queue, you know? Yeah. Um, how, how straightforward is this process? Uh, you know, you've got to fill out a bunch of forms. You, you obviously need the engineer's structural report, that kind of stuff. Is it straightforward? Was it clear? Was it easy enough to do? Um, it, it's not. It's quite laborious, really. It's, um, you know, there, there's an enormous scope for error. Um, and it seems you could, it could be perceived to be designed to make things difficult for people um, in terms of the amount of information they require. Um, but that said, I had um, a very experienced sports administrator with me when we did uh, complete the second application and we did attend um, kind of seminars that were given by the sports capital grant people from the department um, to make sure that we got everything right in terms of uh, dotting the A's and crossing the T's. So we were quite happy with the submission that we put in. Um, and, you know, it just went in with all the rest of them. Then at that stage, and we just had to sit back and wait. But we were happy with what we did. Okay, well, let's get to the point where the actual 
application is turned down. We've um, we've had a look at, at um, some of the stuff that has come back. So the selection criteria and the points scored and the weighting. Um, so likelihood of increased increasing participation and or improving performance. The weight on this is seven. You get one in this. It says that uh, the proposed project will have a minor impact on participation. Sharing of facilities, you get zero points for. Sharing not mentioned in the application or sharing mentioned but no license agreement provided slash license agreement provided does not meet requirements of the sports capital program. And then level of socioeconomic disadvantage in the area. The weight of this is five and you get zero. The project is not in a disadvantaged area. So they're saying it's not a disadvantaged area and you don't share your facilities. Yeah, that was disturbing actually to read that, you know. Um, that conclusion is, is absurd. I mean, any, any, anybody that looked into the Blackpool situation generally would discover quite quickly that it's, it's in Cork City's Council's programme for redevelopment. The schools in the area all have their status. So the suggestion that that really kind of knocked me for six, um, and uh, you know I, I, I made representations on it um, and pointed out that 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 the the idea that we want in the disadvantaged area was absurd and it should be looked at, but you know I didn't get anywhere with it. So what does it tell you then when you look at? that particular element of this application and you see some uh, an area like Wesley getting the money that potentially you are not getting. I know it's, a, it's under a different, more localised scheme than the regional applications and also in terms of that, the, the sharing of the facilities and I guess the, the technical merits of the project. Essentially when it comes to participation, participation in the Neptune Basketball Club would have to cease according to your engineering report. So there's a number of things here which just seem a little bit out of kilter from the results that you got back. For sure, um, we did point that out to the people prior to submitting the application that there wasn't any um, kind of area in the report where we could point out that our, our issue wasn't increasing the numbers of the members that we had. Our issue that we are facing is that we won't have any more. That, you know, if we don't have a functioning building, the participation will cease. Um, so whatever about increasing the numbers uh, we have in the club, the problem is more immediate. Um, and, uh, you know, th there, there was nothing in the application that allowed us to get that point across properly, only to make representations after the fact, after the submission went in. So, um, yeah, it's, it's strange the way it's set up, uh, for sure. Um, you know, when you consider what, what's gone on, what, what's transpired, it's, it's kind of sad, really, you know? So, so just to be clear on that uh, participation point, Paul, if you were a young basketballer in Blackpool, in Cork, where would you have to travel to to play basketball uh, for a club should uh, Neptune Stadium, which should the roof give way at this point, which the engineering report has stated it might do, is there another option for them in the local area or is this the only option for them to participate? Well, if you were a basketball player in Cork, you'd be fairly fortunate because the north side of the city is kind of a hotbed for basketball, so there are other options in terms of clubs, but, you know, those, those other clubs would be relying on schools and, and other kind of community gyms for practice, whereas, as, uh, as you said, we're in a kind of unique position ourselves in terms of having the responsibility to kind of fund and, and repair our own building, you know? Paul, when you went and, and uh, sought some clarification from your local TD and local representatives about where the actual funding had gone, what did you find? Um, in a word, nothing. Um, you know, the, the, I got the, the usual one line or back, you know, that we've, uh, we've received your uh, query and, and, and we'll revert back to you in due course. And that's, you know, it just, I suppose... What we're trying to do in our club is difficult enough, you know, a lot of the times it's like trying to push a boulder up a hill. And then when you start getting these kind of um, dismissive responses from from government officials and TDs, it, it, it does take the wind out of your sails, there's no doubt about it. Um, but we certainly didn't receive any kind of help or direction or 
or support. That's 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 one thing for sure. I know. And when the the results were actually published, where did most of the money for the local region go to? Well, that's that's one of the questions that I've asked uh, for clarification because my understanding of it is is that the entire allocation of regional funding went to the one project in in Tralee, um, which I just I, I couldn't quite believe it really. Um, and again, I'm not here to kind of be the GA with a stick or any other club for that matter. Um, you know, they're all dissolving over in their own, right? But it just seemed very unusual that it's my understanding that the regional development pot was increased substantially by by a matter of millions, and I've asked for clarification on that, but I haven't got it either. So it just smacks of, um, you know, there's something wrong here, right? Like. So just to clarify, sure. you, you, you think that the amount of money to be given to... The, the region, which I guess would include Cork and Kerry. I don't know how, how it breaks up. Do you know the, the geographical spread of that? I don't. Um, I'm not sure if there's a geographical spread, but I think the criteria for regional funding is that your, your project must require funding of more than 150,000. Okay. And so that was that was the process that you went through. That's why yours mm -hmm. was, was uh, termed regional. And that it's your understanding that the amount available for regional funding was increased and that all of the money, including the increase, went to one project. Yeah, that's that's my understanding of it. Just in terms well, it of, has to be my understanding of it because I've asked the question and I haven't got the answer back. Well, we did offer Minister Ross the opportunity to come on the show this morning, but he's unavailable. Uh, I'm not sure why he's unavailable, but uh, the department said he would be unavailable to us. Yeah, and in terms of other questions that the department have been asked in recent days, one of the questions, um, just in terms of the response that the department gave me yesterday, uh, was uh, were all 443 unsuccessful applicants eligible to appeal? Their response is that all 463 invalid applications and 200 partially invalid applications were invited to appeal the department's decision. I guess my question to you, Paul, was were you invited to the appeals process? Were you invited to submit an appeal and essentially get this element of disadvantaged area, which seems to be the big bugbear here, looked at? No, I wasn't, and I was quite surprised to hear that there was uh, an appeals process. We certainly weren't given the option to appeal, um, formally or otherwise. Um, it just wasn't made available to us. Um, should it, what, had there been a, a, a process to appeal, I would have taken it, because the, the mistake was so obvious. You know, it, it was a no-brainer in terms of um, winning an appeal, if there was an appeal available to us. You guys got, you know? you guys got 28 points. That, that was your total score. Do you know what mm -hmm. the score you have to get before you'll be considered for a grant or before you're eligible for a grant? Do you know what, the, what, that, what that score is supposed to be? I don't. So it doesn't seem like I it's don't. the clearest process or procedures in place for this. It doesn't. Um, it certainly doesn't, no. Um, and, you know, another thing that kind of caught my eye was the amount of clubs that got just 150,000, you know. Because that's... They a just, squandered. They just yeah. they came under, under the threshold for regional granting, you know, whether that's by, by luck or by accident, I'm not quite sure, but... You know, they seem to have engineered a way where they could give certain clubs 150, the maximum of the the other pot. Yeah. If you understand. Wesley right. is, is one of those particular mm -hmm. institutions. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, all right. You know, it would be interesting if you held the, the two applications side by side, wouldn't it? Wesley's yeah. and Neptune's, just to see, you know. Well, we'll do our best to, to see if we can get a, our hands on a, a copy of that. It might prove difficult, I suspect, mm -hmm. under the circumstances, given that they didn't meet the criteria the first time around and they got it on appeal, which always is interesting that some people know how to appeal and some people aren't told about the appeals process. Um, Paul, what's next for you? Well, like, what, what do you do from this point forward? Cause, uh, look, just to, to reiterate, I suspect that you're not a full-time employee of Neptune, right? You're a volunteer. That's right, too. So um, what do we... We, we're, we're, we're fighting fires in terms of um, keeping the building operational. It's a, it's a continuous struggle for us. Um, you know, I have no doubt in the absence of funding that we, we'll have to find considerable resources again during the summer to, 
to, to try and, and get the roof repaired as best we can. But that's not an ugly situation. It's not a situation that we can continue to do. Um, for practical reasons, as much as anything else, the, the roof just needs to be fixed. You know? In its entire sea like so... Well... We wish you the best of luck with that project, Paul, and maybe you keep in touch with us about how it's going. And, like, there's no, I don't know, there's no advice beyond um, asking one of the uh, local government TDs to um, intercede on your behalf, because, unfortunately, it appears that that's how this system works at the moment. For whatever they say about um, these being independent of political interference, that certainly doesn't seem to be the case. So that's the grim reality of the country we live in at the moment. Paul, thanks very much for joining us this morning, and best of luck. OK, guys, thanks a lot. Paul Barrett, the chairperson of Neptune Basketball in Cork, um, who didn't get their grants. Um, just to prove that this isn't something that's brand new, right, uh, let's pull up a story from the Irish Times. The date there, if you can't make it out, is May 2004. Almost three million for Kerry sports clubs. Sports organisations in Kerry, among them several rowing clubs, received three million in grant aid under the 2004 Sports Capital Programme announced earlier this month. The bulk of the money went to GA clubs to Kerry South, the constituency of the Minister for Sport, Mr O'Donoghue. A small number of clubs in Kerry North got around a million. So that's three million, Kerry North and Kerry South. Now this was when Kerry had um, two separate constituencies. Obviously it's a five-seater now, is that right? Yeah. Right, so then they continue to go on and talk about um, among the recipients this year were several organisations in the Minister's own local electoral ward, Kilorglan, in which his brother, the sitting councillor, Mr Paul O'Donoghue, and two other Fianna Fáil candidates are standing for election. In that ward, Steam Rowing Club got 80 grand, Carsevine Rowing Club got 100 grand, Over the Water Rowing Club near the Minister's hometown of Carsevine received 30 grand, and Valencia Regatta Committee also received some 7 grand. Lawn Rangers in Clorglin, 200 grand. Kemmer Shamrocks GA Club, a similar amount. South Kerry Sports Centre, 250 grand. The best bit of this, though, is the rowing club in Clorglin. So if we can scroll on to the next page, right? It emerged yesterday that the 106 member Clorglin Rowing Club, currently under construction, was pushed up the list of points needed to allow it to qualify for its first tranche of sports grants in late March 2002. 550,000 euros grant aid in a 16-month period. Some of it under the then minister, Dr. Jim McDade, and then 250 grand in July 2003 under the new minister, Minister O'Donoghue, the Minister for Sport, John O'Donoghue at the time, back in uh, 2004. Uh, you'll also find that if you go back and analyse the grants at that time, that uh, Kildare North, where Charlie McCreevy was from, did very, very well. The Offaly constituency of Brian Cowan did unbelievably well under the sports grant scheme. Donegal did sensationally well when Jim McDade was the Minister for Sport. And Kerry, as we've seen, well, Kerry had their uh, sports facilities looked after amazingly well, even when they didn't meet the criteria by the then Minister for Sport, John O'Donoghue. So this isn't just a Shane Ross thing, it's also a Fianna Fáil thing, and it's also, it turns out now, a Fine Gael thing, because uh, Trilly IT have just got seven and a half million quid. I'm sure they deserve seven and a half million quid, but maybe there's a way of doing it that um, doesn't look so bad. Potentially, uh, also as well, due to the fact that Jimmy Deanahan is stepping away from politics as well, um, I guess kind of, uh, a goodbye gift from uh, a, a, an absolute banker of a Fine Gael or seat. Um, of course, Fine Gael will have to try and hold down their amount of seats in Kerry, and uh, you know th there are there are certain ways of doing things. Now, not everybody is unsuccessful in applying for grants. Um, some clubs do manage to get some money out of this. So let's go to a club that did manage to get some cash from the uh, Sports Capital Programme. Alan Proctor is the secretary of Castle Villa in Kildare, which is uh, Castle Dermot, basically. And uh, Alan, good morning to you. Morning, Joe. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, good. You guys were successful. How much did you manage to get out of the Sports Capital Grants? Yeah, we were successful. We, um, we got awarded a, a total of 400 euros. What did you... What did you <laughs> how much had you applied for? Okay, um, our total application was for it was for about forty or fifty euros less than twenty eight thousand. It was there was three different parts of our application, so there was two um, what were going to be permanent structures, ball stop netting and dugouts, 
And then there was a set of portable goals as well. The goals we have are fixed in the ground as well. So we wanted a set of portable goals. So our application, as part of the application, just to, to fill you in on how things happen, um, as part of the application, you have to put in this uh, a template from the Oscar website. So the Oscar website is the the online sports capital register. So this is where all the applications go in through. So one of those forms that you have to put in, it's called um, an, an evidence of title. So it basically says that we are the owners of the grounds, that we don't need permission from a third party to be able to go and do something as a, as a permanent structure. So at this stage, it was a mistake that we made in our application. We didn't use that template. What we did use was a copy of the deeds and land registry from councils and stuff. So it basically gives them the same information that they wanted, but not in the format that they wanted. So somebody picked up our application, um, had a look at this, deemed it partially invalid, and proceeded as an equipment-only application just for the goalposts. Now, we didn't find out this until the day that the, um, the, the, the grants were announced at the end of November. Haven't had the application in on the 22nd or 3rd of February, whenever the closing date was, so nine months later. So all they had to do was say, uh, lads, you've, you've missed a box here. You need to tick this box. And Exactly, yeah. yeah. We basically misread the instruction on it. I don't know if, like, I mean, anyone that's, that's listening that's, that's filled out these things, there's, there's a mountain of work in it. There really is. And there's, there, was, there was a handful of us involved. Um, well, I, myself, I was looking after that particular side of it. I missed that particular instruction. We put up the information that we thought that the guys were looking for in there. It was the right information, but it was in the wrong format. So exactly, it was like clicking the wrong box or something. We uploaded the wrong document. The document that they were looking to upload is a very simple document. It was print it, get it signed by our solicitor, scan it, and re-upload it. It's essentially what we've done with the information, but just it wasn't in the correct format. Yeah, so essentially, you're kind of getting punished here for not having gone through the process already. like or not having the, the manpower available to you to be able to Yeah, sit yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we, we went through Sports Capital 10 years ago. Um, we got funding for an all-weather pitch. Um, but a lot of the people that were there involved at the time, uh, we've sort of, the committees have changed. You know yourself, yeah. people change in committees and people to take on different jobs. So I suppose the, the real galling thing about our application was that in the length of time it took someone to investigate what had happened with the document, separate the thing into three, discard two of them and proceed with one, surely an email could have come out or a phone call could have come out and say, guys, listen, you're missing a document. You have 24 or 48 or a week to get it sorted out. Get it back into us and we'll see where we go from there. But the fact that there was absolute zero communication from anybody until the 30th of November which, by the way, we didn't find out officially. We actually found out on social media of one of our local TD. He printed a, or he got a, a screenshot of the award. So we found out on social media. And I actually genuinely, when I seen the 400 judge, I genuinely thought it was a typo. Uh, Alan, and I know you weren't uh, involved in any sort of appeal during this process. You didn't submit an appeal, but uh, no. my, que my, my question around that, though, is a, is a different one, and it's the same one I asked Paul, and it's worth reiterating uh, the statement here from the department saying that all 463 invalid applications and partially invalid applications were invited to appeal the department's decision. So the same question to you, were you invited to appeal the department's decision? Okay, the, the sixth. The announcement was on the thirtieth of January or the thirtieth of November. But the sixth of um, December, we got an email saying, "Yes, uh, this is the appeals procedure." Now, basically, what the appeal procedure is is, uh, is whoever wants to appeal would, consider, would give uh, detailed reasons as to why they feel that their application should not be deemed invalid. Mm -hmm. um, there's one line in that particular email, and I'll just read it out if you don't mind. It says, "No changes to the original decision." will be taken in cases where an applicant failed to upload the correct supporting documentation. So based on that line, we took the decision not to appeal because we were after putting that amount of work into it. We said, right, listen, okay, we, it's our mistake. We've, we've held our hands up. Um, you know, we didn't put in the correct document, so we're not going to appeal. The, 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 we, we sort of, you know, agreed that the, 
the detail in that email was the rules that they were going to stick to. So we said it would be frivolous that we didn't, we weren't going to go ahead with it. Um, again, it's just that there was a list of invalid applications um, produced on that website as well, and we're not on there because it's partially invalid. Now, I don't know what other clubs and other organisations' situations are, but I checked that again last night just to be 100% sure, and Castle Villa is not mentioned on the list of invalid applications, even though it's partially invalid. So, again, like your previous um, contributor was saying, it's, it's the, there's a lack of communication there and a lack of clarity and a lack of ease of, of finding out information. That's the big problem for, for, for us, you know what I mean? Do you think you would do things differently the next time? Um, well, we'd make sure the right documents are in, yeah. Um, but I mean, like, getting the local politicians to make sure that uh, they're making whatever phone calls need to be made. Well, yeah, I mean, to be fair, I mean, when, when, this, uh, when it was announced, um, we made a couple of phone calls. I got in touch with Martin Hayden. Um, he'd be a, a Fine Gael TD for Kildare South and a couple of other guys as well that, that, that work with him. Um, now, Martin, to be fair to Martin, Martin went made a couple of phone calls, found out what was after happening, and could tell us then within 24 hours what was after happening. And he has, over the course of the next sort of week or 10 days or two weeks afterwards, both himself and um, Ivan Keatley, a local councillor, both of them have been very helpful, and they have said that when it comes up again, that they'll sit down with us and go through it. I mean, I've no problem with either Martin or Ivan or anybody else um, that offered help. Now, I suppose in hindsight, maybe we should have went and looked for help. Maybe we should have went and asked these guys, right, like, can you check this over, or is there some way we can go to check this over? But, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, we thought we were, we were okay in the way we were going, but it, it's... I suppose you asked me, would I do anything different? Yeah, I definitely would. We'd be, we'd be getting help from wherever it's available. But finding it where if where it's available was always a difficult a difficulty, you know? Well, it seems like there's a secret code, and either you know the code or you don't. <coughs> and if you know the code, you can get 150 grand. And if you don't know the code, then it's like, no, sorry, uh, we don't like the way that your forms are filled out. And we're definitely yeah. not going to tell you. Yeah, yeah. And no, I'd, be, I'd be very reluctant to, to be critical of any organisation that got funded. And I'm sure there's some fantastic organisations around, especially around to their south where, where we are, um, you know, that, that got funding and they're doing great stuff for their members. But... You know, we've got to look after ourselves, and we've got to look after our application. So now we're, we're 50 years old in Castleville next year, and, and part of this application was to make sure that the, the facility was presented in a, in a manner that we felt was appropriate for a, for a club of our status. You know, it, it's, it's, there's a safety issue with the ball stop then because it goes back onto the car park, and then the car park backs onto the goal. So it is possible that kids can run off the pitch and through the car park and onto the road. So, I mean, it just stops balls going out. You know that that was the, that was the major issue, but it's it's like I said to you, it's, it's very very frustrating that there was no information coming back for nine months. We tried repeatedly to find out what was happening over the course of those, particularly the later part of those nine months, yeah. with with an awful lot of 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 difficulty in finding out when it was going to be announced, and then we find out on social media. I mean, I don't think that's particularly professional or particularly acceptable. No. Alan, yeah. thanks very much for uh, telling us your story and um, hopefully next time around you get more than the 400 quid. Fingers crossed, yeah. Thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it. Alan Proctor there, the Secretary of Castle Villa in Castle Dermot in South Kildare, who were successful, partially successful. It's a ridiculous situation. Yeah, it's, it's one of the lowest figures down there. There's a, a figure for 150 quid for one application, which I think is the lowest in the entire local scheme. It's for a tennis club in Roscommon. Uh, try to get in touch with them. Uh, I'm sure I'll be able to, over the next couple of days, get, get a response. Uh, as our lights just kind of go off in the studio, it's, uh, maybe, we need to get, maybe we need to submit some sort of grants to get these uh, lights back up and running. Stick 150 quid in the meter there and see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 400 quid, one of the lowest ones that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. And uh, yeah, Alan Proctor there of, of Castleville AFC, that's it's an interesting one. So we've, we've heard from the local scheme and we've heard from the regional scheme, two different levels. But I guess if you go back to the Neptune one for just a moment, Paul Barrett, I wonder if you said to him, maybe next time apply for the local scheme and uh, you might get yourself 150 grand. Now, 150 grand is a cap, but you've got a better chance of getting 150 grand out of that than you do out of the one for over 150 grand. 
he might actually say, do you know what, that might be a more kind of shrewd way of doing it. And if Flynn has tweeted uh, to say, here's a nugget for you, Ger. Three years ago, a now defunct American football team who used at Kildara RFC's grounds were awarded 20 grand. Kildara, who have 22 teams, including a disability team, applied this year and were rejected. So, uh, whatever criteria are being used, and whatever sense that it's independent of political interference, it's not working. No. People don't feel like it's fair. It doesn't have the appearance that it's fair. And so if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's time to change this. And the Department of Sport have said that they're reviewing this and they're going to review how the money was spent and what value for money they're getting. But um, John Considine, the UCC academic, has over the last 20 years been keeping a record of uh, where the money has gone and how it's been spent and has come up with proposals to fix the system. It's not that hard to get a system which is completely independent. You s make sure that there's a, an independent body whose job it is to look at these things on their merits and to help people fill in the forms so that ultimately everybody has the same quality of forms and documents submitted and then you're making the assessment based on the merits of each case. But like Wesley on their website say they've got 16 tennis courts. They probably don't need 150 grand from the taxpayer to refurbish one of their hockey pitches. Buffalo Loretto, I don't know what the rest of their sports facilities are like, but it's a fee-paying school. They're already getting massive amounts of money from the taxpayer to pay the teachers in this fee-paying school, while there are clubs around the country who are getting 400 quid. Like, it's insane. And why do we put up with this? Like, we're the ones who are being ripped off here. I don't know why we put up with this. Yeah, like, there's not much more to, to really say beyond that. It, it is kind of, when you look at, the, even just the verbs around this, the resurfacing of a hockey pitch compared to the actual refurbishment on the back of an engineering report that is required for a basketball court in North Cork. It is chalk and cheese. It is it, it's lunacy that this is actually being separated into a, a thing where you can actually say to a, cor or a club like Neptune, sorry, you're in, a, you're in a too rich an area. We're not going to be able to refurbish your roof. Yeah, makes no sense.